Well, welcome back to Disciple You. Um, we have been working through the book of Romans in our time together uh, online. Uh, tonight, as you can see on the screen, we're going to be spending some time in Romans chapter 10. Last week, we were in Romans chapter 8. We've done a little bit of skipping around. Um, but just give you a kind of um, an overview of where we're going uh, tonight, or where we've been and where we're going tonight. You know, early on in the book of Romans, we looked at uh, man's need or man's sinfulness or inability to save himself uh, and the fact that man is without excuse uh, but has uh, on a path of destruction. And then we moved into understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, you moved into understanding that God has responded to that. And his response is the work of Christ and how uh, Christ is our, our hope for justification, our hope for righteousness. And then we spent some time talking about the work of the Spirit last week. Uh, in Romans chapter 9 and into verse 10, uh, Paul spends some time talking about uh, Israel and uh, its possibilities uh, for salvation and God's redemptive work within them. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, we're going to go right into Romans 10, starting in verse 5 tonight. And tonight's theme, uh, or the study's theme, is salvation has always been granted through faith. And, you know, we've worked through our curriculum uh, to kind of help us with this. Um, come up with some of the outline for our studies, but that's uh, the theme statement they've got. So I just encourage you tonight as we begin to tackle this passage to think about <clears throat> what are all the various avenues or different attempts that people have made to secure their own salvation, their own um, pure enlightenment or nirvana or paradise. I mean, there's all kinds of different terms that are thrown out there. But what are some of the different things that mankind has done over the centuries? And what, do you, what, do you, what are we doing right now outside of the Christian faith? You know, whether it's following certain religious practices or trying to live by a certain moral code or um, trying to associate ourselves with certain groups or things like that, things that we're trying to do over and over again. Uh, but as we'll look and see from this passage tonight, you know, salvation is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Uh, so tonight we'll be exploring that as we look at uh, Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as we get started, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Um, Father, I thank you for time and your word. Lord, I just pray to, uh, as we work through this passage that you'll just make your truth clear to us, Lord, that we'll be able to uh, acknowledge it, Lord, and then apply it to our life. Lord, I do pray for someone that's watching this tonight uh, that maybe that doesn't know you. I pray that uh, I pray that their uh, their heart may be receptive, Lord, and they may uh, respond to the truthfulness that Jesus is indeed the only way. And for us that are believers, help us to understand the uniqueness of that message, as well as the call that's in our life to take the gospel to all people. In Christ's name, Amen. All right. So tonight again, we'll be looking at Romans chapter ten. We've broken it up into three different sections. Uh, the first section is called "Confess and Believe." Uh, so looking at this first section, this first passage here, Romans 10, pretty big chunk of scripture here, these first five verses. Uh, let's look at this together. <clears throat> For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the command shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Is saved. A lot is going on in this passage. Let's begin to take it apart, you know, to, to look at it piece by piece. First things first, you know, we have an acknowledgement uh, to Moses, this lawgiver uh, through God. You know, we we look back uh, to the scriptures, we look back into uh, the Exodus and how God uses Moses to to lead his people out of Egypt, and uh, he is that great lawgiver. They're the, the Ten Commandments, they're on Mount Sinai. And as he gives them the law and, and instructs God's people, and in, okay, this is this is how you're to please God, these are the things God expects of you. He sets forth this uh, paradigm of, of understanding who God is and who we are in light of that. And, you know, just as we saw there on the slide, you know, complete obedience to the law is the only way that one can be found righteous. In other words, perfect obedience is what equals righteousness. You know, for us to understand that, we, we acknowledge the reality that um, 
you know, uh, righteousness cannot uh, be accomplished for us because we can. There's no way we can fulfill all the aspects uh, of the law. Um, you know, the law highlights, indeed, uh, more so highlights our sinfulness and our and our inability. So again, looking back at our, our slides here, real quickly, uh, we can't keep the law perfectly. Therefore, our salvation rests outside the law. The law highlights our our our, our inability, our, our sinfulness, our brokenness. Um, you know, as as Paul refers to the law in his writings, it's a it's a tutor. Uh, it's one that uh, prepares our hearts for the truth. So again, as we acknowledge our, our passage there, it says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on law. That person who does command shall live by them. If you're going to base your righteousness on the law, then you've got to follow the law to the T. It must be perfect obedience. And that's impossible for us. There's no, no one that's ever walked on the face of this earth outside of Christ himself, who is the source of our righteousness, that can uh, say that they have had perfect righteousness or perfect obedience uh, to the law. So uh, it's so important for us to acknowledge that truth and then to, to build upon that and understand that uh, in order for us to be, uh, to be saved, it's going to have to exist outside of the law. So again, looking back to our slides here, looking at our slides, righteousness by faith is not centered on works. Uh, we are not required to work our way to salvation. So that being said, again, looking at our passage, it says here what? Uh, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss to bring Christ up. In other words, you, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, there's nothing uh, you can uh, um, do to, to work out your salvation or to work your salvation to, to come to impact. There's nothing that, that Christ needs us to help him with. We don't need to go up to heaven and get Christ and bring him back down. We don't need to ascend to the depths and bring up of the dead Christ so he can be resurrected. God himself does that. That's where the power is at. So as we think about our own salvation, there's nothing that we can do that can accomplish it. Um, you know, Jesus has done all the work for us. Um, you know, he, he suffers, he, he dies. He's that substitutionary atonement, as we've talked a great deal about. Uh, he, he's rose from the dead. You know, he's, he resurrects from the dead through the power of God. God does all of that, and he doesn't need us to accomplish it. He accomplishes it for us. You know, again, as we think about the different things that people do in our own, own time context, or our own present context, cultural context, as well as we think historically, all the things that people have done to earn their salvation or to achieve their salvation, it's about, it's very human-centered. It's about, okay, what we do, what we do, what we do. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. But what we see from a scriptural understanding, from a biblical understanding, is not about what we do. It's about what we can't do and what God does on our behalf. Uh, we can't, you know, help Christ along. It's not me and Jesus working together and making it happen. No, it's all Jesus. And, and Paul, you know, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, he wants to make that very clear to his readers. He wants us, you know, as we work through Romans, to see very clearly that we're sinful, we're broken, we can't do it. God has done something about it. His Spirit has come along to equip us to do that. And now he makes it very clear salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. Not a, not a Jesus plus you, not a... Uh, Jesus plus works, it's all about Christ and what he accomplishes for us. And so as we look at the, the rest of this passage, you know, we, we see there it says what? Uh, who will say, will do all these different things? And it says in verse uh, 8, uh, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Salvation is near to all. The word is near to us. And the way that we find salvation is really two, two aspects to consider. Uh, first, there, first things first, it tells us there in verse uh, um, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So let's, let's unpack that just for a moment. If we confess in our, with our mouth Jesus is Lord, a verbal confession that Jesus is Lord. And the word that's used here for Lord is the same word, uh, that's used for Yahweh uh, in the uh, the Greek version, or what's called the Septuagint of the Old Testament. So basically what we're saying is if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is God, we'll be saved. We understand, we acknowledge his deity, we understand that uh, there's something uniquely special about Jesus, that he is God himself. 
And that being said, that means that we submit to his authority for our life and our, 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 uh, our decisions and all those different things. We are trusting in him and his promises for our salvation. So to say, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we're saying Jesus is God and we're submitting to his authority. And this confession that comes from our mouth, this verbal confession, is a result of what's happened on the inside. You know, as we talk about baptism being a public profession of faith, you know, we would acknowledge that baptism does not save you because that's adding something to Jesus. Baptism is simply a public way of telling people what's already happened in your heart. And so it is when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's a public way of saying what we've already decided in our heart. We've already submitted our heart to, to Jesus and his deity, his, his leadership of our life, acknowledging that he is God and he alone is worthy of our worship. And then we confess that. And then we profess that through a physical symbol like, like baptism. And we've, we've spent some time talking about that. Well, the second aspect, too, there is believe. Uh, if you remember that passage, it says what? Uh, if you believe, what? In your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You believe in the complete work of Christ. I think it's so imperative for us not to, to miss out on the fact, though, it says you believe that God raised him from the dead. So the importance of the resurrection, you know, as we talked about on Easter, you know, what if the resurrection never happened? Well, we'd still be in our sins. We'd still be condemned. All these different things. The resurrection is, is the centerpiece of the Christian faith. So we must confess Christ as, as God, as, as Lord, and we must believe that he did all that he said he would do, and we must believe in the resurrection, which uh, our justification, our right standing with God is tied to. Believe that God uh, sent his son, Jesus, who indeed is God himself from a Trinitarian's perspective, and he dies on the cross for our sin and then rose from the dead for our justification to be made right with God. And it says, therefore, with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses is saved. So this, this truth that, you know, if we believe and we confess, that results in our justification, which is our salvation. We're made right with God. So as we continue to look at these passages, the second section working through Romans uh, chapter 10, is uh, Romans, I don't know why it says 8, 11 through 13. It should be Romans 10, 11 through 13. Oh, got something held over from the last slide, I guess, uh, or last time. It says, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, there's some, some great things that are said here in this passage. First, right out of the gate, those who believe in Christ will not be put to shame. They will not be disappointed. Probably a good way to see that put to shame, uh, you know, translated across context. You know, God keeps his promises. You know, if we call out to the Lord, if we realize that he's our, our salvation, uh, we can trust him. He, he, he He's faithful to keep his promises. It's not going to get you know a few months down the road and God's going to say, yeah, I, I'm really not into this saving stuff anymore and I'm bailing out. No. As we look at the fullness of Scripture and we can think about our own journey, God has been faithful all along the way and he cannot deny himself. Because if he were to back out on us or he were to deny us or take away our salvation, would deny his very identity, deny his own promises. So therefore, he can be trusted. To trust in Christ, to trust in God and our sal for our salvation through faith, you will not be put to shame. You will not be disappointed. It is something that is verifiable, something that will come to pass. So the real question comes to the fact is, you know, we got some out there that, that would say that you can lose your salvation, you, could, you can lose your position in Christ. Well, I tell you this, if... If, if someone can lose their salvation or lose their position in Christ, then they never met the real Jesus. They never understood who God is and how he cares for them and what his plan of redemption or his plan of salvation for them is because it's all a work of God. So to say if you lose your salvation, that would say that some part of God's work was not perfect. There was a flaw in God's plan for your life. But if you've truly experienced the salvation of God, you persevere because he perseveres with us. 
His Spirit resides in our heart and steadily transforms us to be the man and women of faith that He God's calling us and shaping us to be. And we realize that transformation has its bumps and its bruises and its high moments and its low moments and all those things. But the reality of it is the Spirit is still there, as we reflected last week, reminding us that we belong to Him. We belong to Him. Um, we will not be disappointed. God will keep His promises. And the Spirit is that seal that reminds us of that. Again, looking on, it says, Salvation is for all people. There's no distinction. Faith in Christ is the only path for all people. You know, in our passage, it says there, what, uh, about, it speaks about the Jews and, and the Greeks. You know, and Paul's writing to the Jewish believers in Rome uh, in this passage. So, you know, for them to hear some of this, is there, uh, lack of better words, it may ruffle their feathers. But he's saying, you know, salvation is beyond the Jew. It is for all people. And that salvation, which is exclusive of all people, or excuse me, inclusive of all people, is exclusive in message or exclusive in path, uh, and, and that being Jesus. So as we think about the Christian message and seeking to share with people who Jesus is, we have to acknowledge the exclusivity of the gospel. First and foremost, it's a one way, and that one way is through faith in Christ. But it's inclusive, it's open to all people. Jew, Greek, um, you know, any nationality, any race, any uh, this or any that, as we think about the different cultural uh, distinctives that exist within our own, uh, our own time. But it's open for all people with their understanding that that salvation is only found in Christ. So we've seen first and foremost, so we've seen that salvation comes to those who confess and believe, those who confess Jesus as Lord, that he's God, and believe in the complete work of Christ, that God raised him from the dead. And it's open to whoever. Uh, anyone can receive this salvation that is found only in Christ. Well, our, our last section, and I know we've kind of moved rapidly, but these are, these are some powerful statements. It's called, Tell All. So we see in Romans 10, 14 through 15, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. I love this passage uh, as it progresses through. And it really paints a picture of how someone comes to know who Christ is and you know, kind of works through that process. And then also speaks to the responsibility of those who, who do know who Christ are. So real quickly, I just want to kind of throw all this up here on the screen and see, help you to see that progression. First off, you know, in order to be saved, they must first they must call on the name of Christ. Okay, uh, as we've seen in our passage, you know, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So to for someone to 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 be saved, to to have a relationship with Christ, to be justified, they have to call out to Christ. They have to. Uh, acknowledge he's Lord, he's God, and believe that he is who he says he is, and that he 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 died on the cross and rose again from from the dead for our new life, for our our, our resurrection, uh, or our resurrection, our justification. So that's the first thing to call out to Christ. Well, then we see what. But in order for them to call out to Christ, they must believe. Okay, and I know some of this is pretty straightforward. So in order to be saved, they have to call out to Christ. All right, but in order for them to call out to Christ, they have to believe in certain things about Jesus. Believe that He's God. Believe that He died on the cross for us and rose again from the dead, as we said just moments ago. We have they have to believe those things, not just hey mentally I understand. Okay, this is what Jesus is. This is what Jesus accomplished. But believe it in such a way that it changes us. That our life reflects this transformation that's taken place, not just a mental assent to certain facts. Guys, and I think for us, for many of us that maybe have spent a considerable amount of time of our life in church, whether we're raised in church or whatever, you know, many people know a lot about Jesus as far as within a church context, but maybe it's just that. Maybe it's just a head knowledge. Has there been that time in our life or that head knowledge, those things we've learned and been taught about Jesus, that has really sunk into our heart and transformed us? Or we believe it. Believe it in such a way that we're willing to, to give our life 
uh, in exchange for uh, that type of faith to, to, to move forward and, and, and trust Christ uh, with, uh, with all that we are. To move beyond just the words on a page, but a changed heart and writing those words in our heart. So as we kind of, again, reflect on the way things progress here, you know, to call upon uh, Jesus, which brings salvation, we must first believe in the truth. But in order to believe in the truth, we must, what? Hear it. You know, for you to respond to any message, you've got to be exposed to the facts of it. You've got to be exposed to what it is. Um, you know, I've, I've got to know how to do this or know how to do that uh, in order to actually do it. And so it is when if someone wants to know how to believe or what they need to believe in, someone, they have to hear it from someone. They have to hear it from someone and just to continue that in order for them to hear it. What? Somebody's got to tell them. Someone's got to proclaim it. And as we see in that passage, in order for them to proclaim it, someone must send them. You know, as we look at this, uh, this aspect of uh, this uh, progression to salvation, obviously we see how someone becomes a follower of Christ. They believe in the truth. They call out upon Jesus and they're saved. But in order for them to believe, someone has to tell them. And those that are told are sent. Can I tell you this? If you have called out on Jesus, then indeed you have been saved. And because you're saved, that Holy Spirit resides in your heart. And guess what he does? He sends you. He sends you to go and to tell people. So that when other people hear what you have to say, the message, they may believe. They may call upon Jesus. They may be saved. They may be sealed with the Spirit. To sell, throw another one in there. And that same Spirit that sent you will send them. And then they share. They proclaim. Others hear. They believe. They call out upon Jesus. They're saved. They're sealed. They're sent. And on and on and on and go. That's why the Christian uh, faith, that's why following Christ is, <laughs> did not die out in the first century because the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because the reality of the fact this is true. It has lasted because of uh, the, the truthfulness of it, because of the work of Christ in the hearts of men and women and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to send and, 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 and uh, compel people to share under that obligation, knowing that they must tell the truth. So I guess the question comes to us, are we telling the truth? Do we feel like we're sent people? Do we feel like we're sealed people? That the Holy Spirit has done such a work in our heart that we can't help but go and to tell. If we're having a hard time going and telling, then maybe we really need to see where we are with Christ. And one of the things I encourage people to understand is if, if we take a look at our own posture of proclamation, our own approach to evangelism, you dig a little deep and you'll see that if you're struggling to share your faith with people, there's a really good chance that your, your own intimacy with the Lord is lacking. Your own sensitivity to the Spirit's direction in your life is, is deficient because the Holy Spirit will make Jesus known in your life in such a way that other people will see it, other people will hear it from you. Because the only way that someone can become a follower of Christ, as we saw, is what? They must hear it in order to believe, to call, and to be saved. How can they hear it? We have to tell them. And if we're not telling them, then there's a problem on our side of the fence. There's a problem with where we are in our relationship with God and our relationship with Christ. So I encourage you as you think about the uniqueness of the gospel, you think about how it's an exclusive message that's inclusive of all people. Think about your role in that. Think about what God's called you to do. And if you say you're a follower of Christ, then you are a sent person. You're sent to proclaim so others may hear so they may believe, so they may call upon Jesus and be saved. So then, therefore, they may be sealed and sent to proclaim. So others may hear, and on and on and on. That is the economy of, of the spread of Christian faith. That's why the faith spreads. 
Don't let us be that missing piece of the equation. Let us continue to be faithful, to go, to speak, and to share so others may hear and believe. Wrapping things up as we conclude this time, Romans 10, 5 through 15, a few statements we see, and these are actually in the curriculum. It says this, God promises to save all who place their faith in his resurrected son. We talked about that. No distinctions. It's open to all people. The salvation is near. Believing in the resurrected Christ. Salvation through faith in Jesus is available to all people. Exclusive message, but inclusive of all. And believers must actively tell others the gospel and willingly send out missionaries throughout the entire world. And I would say those missionaries are people watching this video if you're a follower of Christ. I mean, yes, there is something to be said about people that go outside of their normal context and go and serve on the mission field. But there's also something to be said about those that look across the dinner table and talk to someone about their faith or go to their neighbor or whatever. So I just encourage you to understand what missions is. It's simply believers taking the message of Christ to others, proclaiming the message of Christ so others may hear, so they may believe, so they may be call upon Christ and they may be saved. And on we go. But guys, I appreciate your attention as you watch this video. I hope it's been an encouragement to you. If you have any comments, feel free to leave those um, there in the, uh, the feed, or you feel free to email us or check us out online. So you guys have a great uh, rest of the week, and um, look forward to, to seeing some of you real soon. Take care.